Hi, so this week's weekly roundup is going to be a little bit different. The reason for this is that a 20 minute roundup takes me around 20 hours to produce, which is really far too long. So the way I'll be doing the roundups from now on is just collect anything that looks interesting on the internet and then hit record while I go through them all. Should be interesting. So if you want me to go back to the old style or continue with the new style, you'll get a chance to be able to vote on this at the end of the video. However, one thing that probably won't change is my sponsorship ads. Well, actually, I might have the chance now to bring back some of the old gags. This video is being sponsored by JLC PCB, who provide all my PCBs. If you want some quick turnaround PCBs, then they are a pretty good mob to go with. They can produce one to six layer boards with 0.4 to two millimeters thickness, track widths down to 3.5 mil, and support BGAs, cutouts, fingers, and other cool things. And they can do all this within 24 hours. They're currently offering 10 PCBs for only $2 in any color. And if you are a first time customer, you'll get $20 off shipping off your first order. Click on the link in the description below to check them out. So first up on Kickstarter, there's the Zeta version 2, which is a three axis wireless gyroscope. Now this one actually transmits the data over RF. So it's transmitting on 2.4 gigahertz RF frequency. Not sure what the RF module is, but it looks like one of those uh, NRF modules. So that's pretty decent. And I suspect it's running a SAMD21. So it's a little bit expensive for a three axis gyro, but you know, hey, has its uses, I guess. And next up, we have the Raspberry Pi for computer vision. So this is an ebook from a guy called Adrian Rosebrock. So it's gonna be fairly good. So it aims to teach you computer vision, deep learning and IOT on a Raspberry Pi. So pretty broad subjects for an ebook, but seems to delve into OpenCV, Mavidius, and also Open Vino Toolkit. So I guess it's pretty good, 95 bucks. And then next we have the PGC PSU. So this is a LiPo battery charger and DC boost converter. Provides 350 milliamps on a five volt rail and 400 milliamps on a 3.3 volt rail. So it's a typical LiPo battery and DC boost PCB. You've got the LiPo battery management circuitry, battery protection circuitry, and the DC boost converter going into a buck stage. So it's pretty, common sort of setup. So interestingly, he's got some fairly detailed comparisons to a TP4056 converter, and he's showing us some fairly decent uh, response times for low power situations and also high power situations, for example, running a Raspberry Pi. But I just noticed that he's also shipping LiPo batteries. So I think that's going to be a bit of a problem for him. He's probably going to be hit with all sorts of import duties and a whole lot of issues. So I think this one's going to be a bit of a problem for him. Uh, so next up is the IVI closed loop 3D printer. Now I normally don't cover 3D printer campaigns and I'm really I thought the 3D printer campaigns were all dead. But uh, here we are back again with a 3D printer Kickstarter. And this one has a $370 price tag. So who knows, it claims to have a resolution of around 10 microns on all axes. So I don't know, who knows? I guess I'll wait for Angus from Maker's Muse to handle this one. Then there's the NanoSound DAC 2. Back in weekly roundup number 51, we saw the NanoSound DAC. So this is the second generation Raspberry Pi hat and it runs a 1.5 inch OLED display, a few buttons to mash, a rotary knob, infrared, has sound quality improvements, uh, improved gitter. Gitter? What's gitter? Oh, jitter. I think they're saying jitter. He also uses better caps, but of course, you know, with this MLCC shortage, there's no surprise there really. Runs a PCM5122 DAC, which is a pretty nice kit. And also the Texas Instruments TPS7A4700 regulator, which is a pretty nice little regulator. So this one looks pretty good as well. Oh, and it's got accessories, a case, nice. And a headphone and speaker amp, and also a CD player and can also rip CDs straight into flak, which is pretty good. Then we have the Nebra AnyBeam. Now my Pi Projectors kicked off a small craze in hackable mini projectors, it seems. 
This one, however, is a laser projector, so there's no focus issues at all, like we see with the uh, Pi projector. So this is pretty expensive uh, for 189 British pounds, but you can get either the pocket version, which has an HDMI input and audio jack, this one can focus from one meter to five meters away, so it's pretty good. Then there's the Nebra Anybeam Developer Kit, which is the same but cheaper, and a Pi Hat with onboard power supply and parallel RGB driving the Nebra Anybeam over GPIOs. And then there's also the Nebra Anybeam Monster Ball. Uh, it looks like a 3D printed ball, uh, but it also contains a Pi Zero W, so they're pretty good. Oh, and all these products are CE and FCC approved. That's actually a pretty expensive thing to undergo. Uh, next up, we have the Wi Phone, Wii Phone, however you call it. This campaign has actually ended, uh, but you can get those in pre order at the moment, uh, which, oh, hello, it's on Indiegogo. So there you go, something decent on Indiegogo after all. Not only is this a phone, but it can handle growth ports and breadboard, and also, oh, wheels. <laughs> uh, okay. Nice. Uh, so what else does it have? Uh, 320 by 240 LCD screen. It's also running an ESP32, running MicroPython. It's got an audio jack, USB charger, and UART bridge, SD slot. And it's got a nice little programming header. In fact, I think they're just pogo pins. We can chuck in a module. Uh, also 700 milliamp hour battery. And oh, look, it's got capacitors. And also screws, even better. And you can change whatever the back plate ends up being and it connects up to those pogo pins that I mentioned earlier. And, okay. Okay, your phone can be an RC car. Radio. And one of the stretch goals is a LoRa-based module that you can add onto the back. So you can potentially make this into a LoRa-based SMS phone. Nice. And over at Indiegogo, there's, oh, okay, there's nothing really. Let's forget that. Meanwhile, on Crowd Supply, the Amiga 2 guys now have a mobile 4G board. This one is based on the Amiga 2 S Plus, which is similar to the Amiga Pro. It contains the Quectel EC25A, which is a 4G LTE and GNSS based GPS. What else does it have? USB Type C power and UART. It doesn't have the 8 gig eMMC like the Omega 2 Pro, but code runs instead from internal flash and also SD. Uh, it does have, however, 30 GPIO pins and the same LiPo battery management that you might see on the Omega 2 Pro. Then the Lime guys are back with the Lime RFE. This is a power amplifier that augments the existing Lime SDR. It covers all the ham, mobile and wideband frequencies. I'm not a hammy, but thought this would be interesting to some of the hammy subs I have. Then there's the easy switch box. If you want to be able to control your light switches from 20 kilometers away, then get one of these. It's a LoRa based switch similar to Seed's Rebutton. It runs the Arduino Pro Mini with either RFM95, RM69, HCW or RFM69CW LoRa transceivers. ATSH A204A crypto chip tuned PCB antenna, two coin cell batteries, which are CR2032s, which they claim to use use. Is that an injected molded case? Who knows? So back in weekly roundup number 62, we saw the giant board. This runs the ATSAM A5D27, which is a 500 megahertz Cortex A5 SOC, and has 20 GPIOs, SD slot, and LiPo charging. This one actually directly supports a bunch of Adafruit feather wings, like Ethernet module and LCD. And then this is another breadboard breakout doohickey, and looks pretty decent. This energy meter looks pretty cool. So what's it running? Is that an Atmel? Oh yeah. So this is an ATM 90E26, which is a nice semi from microchip. You can use it to monitor power consumption of mains powered devices. So this board can hook up to an ESP32 and feed data back to whatever you want. Nice. One of my fellow YouTubers, Sion from Unexpected Maker, has come out with a tiny Pico. You would have seen him talk about this in the video where I catch up with him. So he's been through several design iterations and it looks to be a nice little package based on the ESP32. Now this looks pretty interesting. A programmable USB hub? Cool. Hang on, CircuitPython, Spark FunQuick, Microbus, 6 amp power for all four USB ports? Nice. Uh, it's also got power monitoring and even a proper metal enclosure. So what about the other specs? Four USB 2 high-speed ports, 
USB data lines and power can be individually switched. Nice. Adjustable current limits, power monitoring, as I mentioned before. It also has ESD protection, micro Python support, and the internal firmware just shows up as a normal flash drive. So you can update the firmware just by dumping a new file. And I see it's running the SAMD51, which is nice. So this is actually a pretty cool programmable USB hub. I definitely need to get my hands on one of these. Polar, so what's this do? Oh, a GPS tracker. Okay, so this has an ESP32, SIM 7000 LTE module, and also MPU 650 accelerometer. Also OBD2 SD slot, and can be powered from five to 28 volts, nice. So potentially you could actually have the IMU be able to do some dead reckoning when there's no GPS signal. So that's actually quite a nice little unit. So if you're a fan of having to calculate your time, then the binary clock shield looks pretty cool. It's an Arduino shield with a DS3231 RTC, piezo buzzer, WS2812 RGB LEDs, and a few buttons to mash. Looks pretty nice. So I guess I'm probably going to be saying this the wrong way. Is this the Newton or the NUT2 NT Plus? Who knows? This board is a GNSS receiver aimed at high precision. It runs a Lattice ECP5 FPGA, NT-Lab NT1065 receiver, and is also powered from USB Type-C, which is nice, and has some pretty decent specs. It has some fairly complete software as well, like signal dumping, spectrum analyzer, and also supports GNU radio. Even CNC milled aluminum enclosure, even better. And there's also some decent antennas as well. Nice. So the low dev S76S is yet another STM32 and LoRa combo. Ah, but this one runs the STM32 L073 MCU. So this has an inbuilt SX1276 LoRa radio. So it makes the whole package really small. So of course you can make a weather sensor or a mailbox notifier. Actually, this reminds me, I really should update my MQTT mailbox video. The only issue is that the Arduino support for the STM32L073 isn't quite there yet. But this is a pretty decent option for a small LoRa WAN capable board. Now, this is one I definitely covered in roundup number 60, but back then it was in pre launch. If you want some serious machine learning grunt, then pick one of these M2 based FPGA boards from Crowd Supply. It's actually a pretty nice little board. And look, even Mick Make thinks so. So over at Group Gets, we've got the Low 5 R1. So this is another board designed by Michael Welling. It's a pretty tiny castellated board running an SI5 RISC 5 MCU, clocked it up to 320 megahertz. But it also has 16 kilobyte RAM, 128 megabit SPI flash, 28 GPIOs broken out, and all powered from five volts. And you get all that for 25 bucks. Seriously, if you want to play around with an open source RISC 5 MCU, then get one of these. Okay, so over at CNX Software, they pointed to a couple of new SBCs from Beaky Cloud. Beaky Cloud, is that right? Seriously? Is that how you say it? Okay, so the TB96AI board is a 96 boards compliant SBC. It runs the Hexacore Rockchip RK3399 Pro, which is nice. Runs four gig DDR3 RAM, 16 gig EMC, and also has an RK809 PMIC, which is something that you really need. And also a Spurker. I really wish all SBCs had them. A bit of a shame, really. So this fits into the carrier board, which breaks out absolutely everything, like a Gigabit Ethernet, MIPIA CSI, HDMI, 96 boards compliant headers, SD, JTAG, Gigabit Ethernet. Oh, another one? Oh, okay, two. Excellent. USB 3.0 and two PCIe slots. Nice. So what's on the underside? So the underside looks pretty boring. A couple of dip switches. Oh, it's got an M2 key slot. Oh, even better. Then there's the Beaky, Beaky TB96AI2, whatever you call it, I don't know. But this is a smaller board running the Rockchip RK1808. So this is a dual core Cortex A35 running at 1.6 gigahertz. It also has four gig DDR3 RAM, 16 gig EMMC, audio in out, MIPI CSI, HDMI, and USB 3. So both these modules connect into that carrier board using these GPIO headers. Oh look, the shipping list, you get a board and a bag. Excellent. So over at Aon, they have the Boxer 8130 AI. This runs the Jetson TX2, blah, 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 eight gig DDR4 RAM, 32 gig eMMC, blah, blah, blah. So, oh, six MIPI CSI2 interfaces. Uh, this isn't going to be cheap. Let's see what the eShop says. 
Holy cow, a thousand US dollars? Seriously? Okay, if you have the money and you want some serious Emil grunt, then this is probably going to be the thing for you. Meanwhile, over at AVNet, they have a much better price board based on the Zinc Sock. For the 249 US dollars, you also get two gig DDR4 RAM, SD slot, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Mini DP, USB 3.0 and 2.0, and also a 96 boards compliant header. And the whole shebang is powered from a 12 volt DC input. Nice. So something else CNX Software pointed me to is also a company called Novasom. who have a bunch of industrial SBCs, so they're probably going to be expensive. They have several ranges, the M, the U line, the P line, the N line, and the S line. The M line is for multimedia applications and get boards based on the Rockchip RK3328, Snapdragon 41E, Snapdragon 410E, Intel Apollo Lake 6 Gen. But you also get redundant power, high def audio, dual gigabit ethernet, mini PCIe, nice, and also four gig RAM. That's pretty good. So what about the Uline series? So these are designed more for low power applications. So there's one based on the ESP32, and there's also one based on the NXP IMX6 ULL CPU. Both have UPS manager, which apparently means you can power it from five to 18 volts, and have it auto switch between battery and DC power, nice. Then there's the P-Line, which you can get in a range of IMX6 socks. And seems to be the same lineup as the P-Line, but really with different socks. Ooh, nice, M2 key slot. Then there's the N-Line, which is aimed at ICT, whatever the heck that means. I guess that's probably storage and network. So of course it's gonna have mini ITX based board. And they keep talking about UPS, but that's just a fancy term for multi-path power, I think. Dual gigabit ethernet, uh, SATA 3 and 3 mini PCIe slots. This is actually pretty good. Then there's the S line, which also has the IMX6 based socks. And this looks more like a traditional SBC. Uh, 4 gig DDR3 RAM, 32 gig eMMC, and oh, got 3.6 to 48 volt DC input. Nice. Gigabit Ethernet, RTC, and HDMI. So these are probably the cheaper based SBCs on offer. There's actually no indication of pricing, so you'll probably have to order 700 of them or something like that. So over at GenieTech, they have the APC810. This is based on the NXP IMX8M, 3 gig DDR4 RAM, 16 gig EMC, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. Oh wait, no Bluetooth. Uh, gigabit Ethernet, do I have any specs on it? Yeah, let's go to specs. Oh no, sorry, it does have Bluetooth. SD slot, HDMI out. Oh, also HDMI in. Wonder if that works. USB type C. This actually looks pretty good. So back in weekly roundup number 54, we saw the Azure Sphere MT3620. Now AVNet have released a tiny castellated module that runs this little baby. It breaks out a whole bunch of GPIOs with RTC, two UFL connectors, and it looks pretty good. Where's the starter kit? So they also have, have you finished loading? They also have a starter kit, which this module can be soldered to, which has micro and grove headers, onboard IMU, temperature, barometer. Uh, it also has an OLED interface and USB. Looks pretty good for 75 US dollars. So over at Medium, they pointed to the kettle pop. And so what's good about this? Oh, wow. Some dude bought up a huge stock of the liquidated Next Things GR8 SIPs, and he's added 8 gig eMMC, AXP209 PMU, and pushed out 30 GPIOs. And he's selling them for $39 a pop. Unfortunately, there's only 500 of them, so get them while they're around. So Arbor has nothing to do with trees, but they do sell green SBCs. It's yet another company with no pricing, so they probably expect to sell thousand off units. But hey, you can get a range of different SBCs. So the first one is the SOM RK391, which runs the Rockchip RK3399, has two or four gig RAM, 16 gig EMC, SD, gigabit ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and also USB type C, RTC, and it's a pretty decent SOM. Then there's the RP301, which has one to four gig DDR3 RAM, 16 gig EMC, SD slot, 100 megabit ethernet, USB UART. What's that sock? Oh, it's the Rockchip PX30. And both of those modules fit into the PBA9000, 
great name, and breaks out all the important stuff like USB Type-C, UART, Ethernet, and also has an M2 key slot, nice. Then you also have the EMQ RK390, which runs the RK3399 SOC, two or four gig DDR3 RAM, USB, gigabit ethernet, and that's good, it's using the RTL8153 controller. Also HDMI and a bunch of other things, nice. And that actually fits into this carrier board, which is also a Q7 based carrier board, and that breaks out pretty much everything so if you head on over to Numato, they have an M2 key slot based FPGA board that, holy cow, $400? Man, that's expensive. Why is it so expensive? Okay, so Xilinx Arctix 7 FPGA, that's okay. Two gig DDR3 RAM, okay, that'll bump the price up. One gigabit quad SPI flash, oh yeah, that'll do it. And a TPM as well. Yeah, no wonder why it's so expensive. But really for what it is, it's still pretty good bang for your buck. So back in weekly roundup number, oh hang on, I think I missed this one. Then back in February, PiBoard announced the PiBoard D, which was based on the STM32F7, but also has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. Basically, it's a really nice unit. However, they've recently announced a lower cost version for around 56 US dollars. For that, you get the STM32F7 to two megabit quad SPI flash, RTC, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, SD slot, Oh, W bus, nice. These are two W bus connectors and really breaks out a heck of a lot of GPIOs. The whole package comes in at 23.8 millimeters by 33.5 millimeters. So pretty tiny. So I think Microsoft first coined the phrase, eat your own dog food, which means if you expect your customers to use your product, you should be doing the same. So the Pine64 guys are taking this on board and plan to run their entire website on a cluster of Rock Pro 64s. Now that's going to be pretty interesting. Meanwhile, the upboard guys seem to be really getting into neural networks. They've just released the XM2280, which, okay, seems to be similar to the previous 2242, but it's got one extra VPU, which is the Intel Movidius Mirrored X. Why can't they stick to short names? Eight gig DDR4 RAM. So that's actually pretty good. And I believe this is actually selling for 149 US dollars on pre-order. So not too bad for what you're getting. Meanwhile, over at Amazon, they have the Atomic Pi. Oh, hang on. Last time I looked, they had it. I think I might get one of these. I definitely need to review it. However, from what I've heard, people are running into all sorts of power supply issues. And really looking at the power supply options, it's probably no surprise there. So John Lee from Espressive Systems has sort of casually mentioned that there might be another ESP chip on the horizon. And his objectives, lower cost, seriously? Wow, that'll be interesting. More knobs for tuning. Okay, I'm gathering it's not physical knobs. And looks like they may drop USB support. Okay, there is gonna be USB support, apparently. So meanwhile, over at my favorite maker store, Tindy, there's the Bonadrone board, whatever, that actually ends up meaning in Spanish, I don't know. But this is an STM32L4 and ESP32 combo. Why is this so big? Uh, let me reduce the size. There we go. Why is this still so big? Come on. There's also inputs for DC motors and inputs. I think he means outputs. And this is all encapsulated in a small 30 by 30 millimeter PCB. So pretty nice. Then there's the Mego, which is a four to 24 volt portable DC power supply. It's capable of six watts maximum. So it also has a LiPo battery as well, which is nice. And it actually fits onto a breadboard. That's even better. Is that a 3D printed case? But even so, that's a pretty nice compact little unit. So having survived all the boy bands of the 80s, I'm a bit of a retro head myself. And this one looked pretty interesting. So this is a complete replacement for a Sinclair ZX interface. Wait for it to load. Which solves the very common issue of overheating of the original ULA. He's even done a pretty good job of reverse engineering it. Nice. So Turta make a bunch of IoT modules. This one is a two channel DC Come on, hurry up. Like, this one is a two channel DC motor driver for the Arduino MKR. It's based on the TC78H630 FNG DC motor driver and also has protection diodes and regulator. So I guess it's got everything. There's also this sensor shield. Hang on, why did I find this interesting? What's so interesting about this? 
Oh, okay. It's running the HTS221 temperature and humidity sensor, APDS9960 gesture sensor, MMA8491Q3 DOF IMU, and SD slot. So, yep, bang for your buck is pretty good if you have an Arduino MKR. So back in one of my previous mailbags, we came across the I2C based rotary encoder. So this I2C nav key was made by the same guy. This one gives you a jog shuttle that's accessible over I2C, also has an RGB LED and works from 2.5 to 5 volts. And there's also a pretty decent register map. So you get up, down, left, right, center, wheel and center button. There's also an additional three GPIOs which you can actually control. So this is actually pretty cool. So back in weekly roundup number 58, we saw the AT Tiny 3217, but there hasn't been too many boards made for it. Well, here's one. Of course, forget using the Arduino IDE. You'll have to use bare metal programming or use the Atmel Studio to program these things. It uses the UPDI programming method, which is also new. So something similar to the previous board is the AT Tiny 814 development board, which you can pick up from the same guy. So over at IT, they have in the new Sonoff RFR3. This is actually pretty similar to the other Wi-Fi based Sonoff modules, but these ones also have RF control over 433 megahertz and are pretty cheap as well. There's also the basic R3, which is the same. The basic R3 doesn't have the RF receiver. It's not really clear what improvements have been made over the previous Wi-Fi modules though. Meanwhile, over at C, go away. Meanwhile, over at Seed Studio, they have their W600 module. This module is really an ESP32 in disguise, but without Bluetooth. There's plenty of GPIOs and is driven from 3.3 volts. And you can plonk it on this, which has the SAM D21 and a Grove port. How do you power the thing? Oh, you power it over the Grove port. A little bit odd, but okay. So this is pretty interesting. Normally fully metal robotic arms are pretty expensive, but this is only 47 bucks. Well, at least when it's back in stock. So it's a pretty complete kit. So four servos, servo wheel, servo driver pie hat, war wart, and all the metal bits to make a nice little arm grabby thing. So that's pretty good for the price. Don't expect pick and place accuracy though. Okay, so why did I bookmark this one? It's an RTC. Oh, okay. So it's using the NXP PCF8523 RTC chip. You actually don't see many of those chips around and it's supposed to be a fairly accurate RTC. So the RTC is powered from one to 5.5 volts. It has 150 nano amp backup current. It's all temperature compensated. You know, all the good stuff. Pick one of these up from C Studio. Now the DWM1000 does look expensive and yes, you are absolutely right, it is. But this is a no module to be used with the loco positioning system. So if you remember my IMU video I made, the issue I highlighted in that video is that IMUs tend to drift and that drift is actually cumulative. So one way around it is to provide beacons in a room. So loco calls this anchors and this should actually correct the drift. So you can pick up a complete kit for, holy cow, $1,400. All right, so if you're really serious about accurate positioning in a room, then this is the thing for you, I guess. So the Seed Studio module can act as an anchor or a node, but bear in mind it's useless without at least four anchors. So this actually contains the STM32F072 MCU, DWM1000 Deca Wave module, which adds to the overall cost, USB, FTDI, you know, all the good stuff. The re button, it's a Wi-Fi button. So Seed Studio claimed that you can have more than 500 button presses per LiPo charge. There's also, can you refresh? There's also I2C Grove connector, Arduino IDE support, but there's no USB bridge nor header. So you'll need to BYO your own programmer. You might have to get one of these to see if it actually supports OTA because it's gonna be a bit of a pain without it. So Adafruit, the Metro M4 has been out for a while now, but I couldn't really find which weekly roundup I covered this in. But anyway, this baby has the AT Sam D51 J19. The J19 means basically more flash RAM. It has also 25 GPIOs, airlift Wi-Fi chip, two megabyte quad SPI flash, and it's all powered from seven to nine volts DC. It's also got reverse polarity, which is nice. Yes, I've blown up enough boards to want this.
And if 25 GPIOs isn't enough for you, then get this running the 80 SAM D51 P20. Is 70 GPIOs enough for you? No. So what else does it have? Seven to nine volt DC input, similar to the previous board, 3.3 volt logic levels, eight megabyte quad SPI flash, and also SD slot. Looks pretty nice. And yes, I did mention the airlift earlier. This is what it is. It's just Adafruit's lingo for an ESP32 breakout. But this one has its own regulator and level shifter. What's that, an HC4050? Okay, yep, that's the TI version of the classic 74HCT4050. It's a pretty common IC to use for logic level converters. And this is one I used on my Works Raspberry Pi PCB. So next, in the coming soon department, the CircuitPython Playground X. Hang on, what's 4H? Oh, okay. A STEM education organization for kids. Excellent. That's what we want to see. Okay, so this is basically the Circuit Playground Express, but with a 4H logo. Good to see Adafruit supporting this organization. The Pluto SDR looks fairly cheap at only $160 a pop, but this seems to be a learning module based on the analog devices AD9363 and also Zinc Z7010FPGA. It supports 325 megahertz to 3.8 gigahertz, 12-bit ADC and DAC, and is also a transmitter, not just a receiver. This is looking better. Supports MATLAB, Simulink, and GNU Radio. You know, SparkFun seem to be selling more esoteric products. This is the MAX30110, which is an optical pulse oximetry and heart rate detector. It's similar to those other cheap ones you see in China, but this one is the bee's knees of medical sensing. It's a nice one. Why are the images so small? What the heck? And of course, everyone's selling the Google Coral USB accelerator. Uh, you can pick it up from SparkFun. You can also pick it up from pretty much everywhere else. And meanwhile, DF Robot have an update on their Pink Z development board. So this board runs the Zinc XC7Z020, which is a 650 megahertz dual core Cortex A9 and FPGA combo. Also has 512 megabyte DDR3 RAM, gigabit ethernet, USB, quad SPI flash, SD slot. Hang on, HDMI in as well as out? Oh, nice. Two PMOD headers, Arduino headers, Raspberry Pi headers, and 28 FPGA based GPIOs. This is a nice board. Okay, so something I haven't done for a while is go through all the China based shops. So, since I'm doing things differently, I'm gonna spend some money. So, I have 50 bucks. What can I get? Let's see. Okay, so Banggood. Yep, so it would be nice to have one of these open log data recorders. They're always handy to have around. So the current draw is around about five to six milliamps idle and 20 to 23 milliamps while writing. Uh, but I think I'll skip this one. Wi-Fi based keyboard? Oh, cool. I like how they call it bad USB. I guess it could be bad. So what makes it bad? I guess it's got an Atmega 32U4 providing USB, of course, a 74HC4050 logic level converter and ESP8266. All the good stuff to be evil with. Okay, next. Okay, so I clicked on this randomly for some reason. A thousand trainees for 30 bucks. That's pretty good. Uh, pretty tempting, as I often need one of these trainees anyway, but I think I'll skip this one. Or you can get some German-based transistors. These are more efficient than the English ones. And yes, I kinda would like to get a bunch of USB to RS-485 converters. Hang on, FTDI interface? FT232RL? Does it have a real FTI chip? I guess for that price, probably not. Anyway, next. So Analog LAM normally don't have many new things, but they've chucked a few up. The Sipid Mayx bit we saw in one of my mailbags. It's a pretty nice little PCB that can do full object tracking using a Kendrod K210. Nice unit, but I already backed this on Kickstarter. But this Kendrod KD210 based board looks pretty tempting. What are all those jumpers? Are they jumpers? Yeah, they look like jumpers. So you can disable parts of the board. So this breaks out a TFT LCD, SD card, USB Type-C, and also a bunch of mics. Nice. Goo board? Is that goo or gooey, or is it a silent U? Anyway, this has an ESP32, uh, what else, an audio amp, TFT touch display. No, hang on a second. Oh, it's just an ordinary TFT LCD and two touch buttons. It's also got an SD slot and CP2102 USB to UI bridge hiding underneath there, yep. So this is another tempting one, but I actually already have one of these. We also saw these back in weekly roundup number 50, but good to see the prices are coming down. And the Kendrite K210 modules would be really tempting as well, but I don't really have a need for it. So maybe next time. Oh yes, 
Now this is what I want. I haven't seen any Lattice Mark X02 FPGA boards yet. So this one has either an FT232 or STM32F07 as the programmer, two segment LCD displays, four buttons to mesh, micro USB for power and programming. And if you use the STM32F07 based programmer, it acts as a USB flash drive. So all you have to do is just dump files to a USB flash drive and you can program it. Oh man. If only we had mobile 2G towels still around, this would be so tempting. So this is actually a complete mobile package with LiPo charger, SD slot, camera interface. It's really cool, but completely unusable where I live. Now this is useful. I already have a bucket load of ESP32 modules and this would make programming them a whole lot easier. So Elicrow, anything, anything? Uh, nothing really. Shenzhen to you, anything? No, they never really have anything. But over at IC Station, this would be kind of nice to have. What are these? There's a couple of places in the house that I need to monitor temperature, and this would make it really dead easy. Oh, but it's also a main switch. Okay, kind of dubious about the 16 amp current, but I would only be switching LED lights, so I guess that's probably all right. And here's another one. What's the difference? Oh, okay. It uses the AM2301 temperature sensor, which also includes humidity. In fact, it's the one that's used by Sonoff, I think. Oh. Okay, so now this is good. Being able to translate between different USB types is a good thing. I think I'll get it. I've been wanting to get one of these for a long time. And I do really need to get one for testing my work's UPS boards. So a digital load tester simply applies a fake load to your device under test. The better ones are more accurate, so I'm not sure how well this will go. So their claim is it goes from four to 25 volts, has 1% current accuracy, 0.5% voltage accuracy, handles a five amp load and deals with all sorts of over current over voltage all sorts of things and excellent uses plain old uart for control okay i think i'll get this one and then we have the stm32 f767 development board 29 bucks hmm so it'd be really great to be able to play around with one of these newer f767s but you know what I already have enough projects running at the moment. It is pretty cool though. For 30 bucks US, you get a Cortex M7 MCU, 16 megabyte quad SPI flash, eight megabyte SDRAM, and pretty sure it breaks out every GPIO out of the STM32, giving you ethernet, USB, SDIO, CAN, USB power management. It's a pretty cool little MCU. No wait. This is what I need. I can test out my design assumptions for one of my SIM 800 based works boards. So this unit gives you not just the SIM 800 module, but a CH340T USB to UI bridge. So what else? A SIM slot, of course. I think I'll get this. Okay, let's see how much I've blown my budget. Oh, really? Okay, let's take off the GUI board. And I think I'll have to do without the FPGA board for now. Okay, I've only blown it by 99 cents. Oh, nice. Okay, so that's the end of weekly roundup number 65. As I mentioned earlier, I plan to move to this format for all the weekly roundups as it makes it a whole lot quicker and I'll actually be able to publish this video weekly as opposed to what I'm doing at the moment, which is monthly. So I discovered there's actually not that much difference as I was going back through and editing the video, but some people might actually not like my rambling that goes on uh, when I discover things. So place your vote now if you want me to publish in the old format or the new format. So as always, links to everything are up on my website and don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Thanks for watching and see you next week.